Right. Well, good Sabbath, everyone. And I just want to welcome welcome everyone who is here today. Uh, I guess we've got a couple that are either out of town or sick or whatever it may be. Let's be sure we remember them today. Uh, let's ask God to be with us today. Father, our, uh, our purpose of being here is to worship you. We're just, just grateful that you have called us together, that you have established us as, a, as one local church out of so many, many others. And it's just good that you've chosen that way for your people to serve each other and to, and to serve out in the world. So Lord, just, just increase our love for you and for each other. Build us up in the faith. We just pray that, that our worship can be acceptable to you as we hear your word. We sing your praises and as we pray for the needs of your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, first song is... Holy but goody, how great thou art. Let's stand and sing that. Somebody was tall that was here before. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture reading is Mark 3, 23, 2, 23 to the end and then 3 to 6. I'm reading from the message. <clears throat> One Sabbath day, he was walking through a field of ripe grain. As his disciples made a path, they pulled off heads of grain. The Pharisees told, told on them to Jesus, look at your disciples. Your, look, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus said, really? Haven't you ever read that David, when he was hungry, along the, with those who were with him, how he entered the sanctuary and ate the fresh bread off the altar with the chief priest, Abathar, right there watching? Holy bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat and handed it out to his companions. Then Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The Son of Man is no lackey to the Sabbath. He is in charge. Wonderful. Then he went back to the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He said to the man with the crippled hand, Stand here where we can see you. Then he spoke to the people, What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye, one after another, angry now, furious at their hard-nosed religion. He said to the mass, hold out your hand. He said to the, he said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out. It was his Good as new, the Pharisees got out as fast as they could, buttering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your holy word. Thank you that we are able to read it every day. We are blessed. Bless us today as we listen to our sermon, our speaker today. 
Thank you so much for this place to worship. Amen. In days there are all sorts of popular slogans. Um, thought about like sharing a hundred of them here, but uh, anyway, uh, what's interesting is that a, once something becomes a popular slogan, it often becomes shortened to the initials. Notice that? So, for example, if I say uh, OMG, I'm guessing probably everybody knows what that means because we've heard it so many times anymore. That started out as a real cry of, you know, cry out to God as a help. And I mean, this is not a slogan, but it's kind of similar to the word awesome, which used to mean God is awesome. Now, almost anything in the world is awesome if we like it. Oh, here's another initialization that I'll bet everybody knows, and that's LOL. Goodness, texting and internet has hundreds of those now. Well, Christians do this too. Uh, some of us might remember a slogan that has been popular among Christians for many, many years. Uh, I think I heard it first, probably back in the 70s. And uh, this popular slogan I'm referring to is, what would Jesus do? Ever heard that one? And so as you can imagine, it was shortened to WWJD. And again, some of us can probably remember where that slogan came from. Who knows? Where did that come from? Okay. It's from a book uh, written by a man named Charles Sheldon. The title of the book was, or is, <laughs> In His Steps. Uh, I'm guessing maybe nobody besides me has read that book is here. If you ever get a hold of it, it's a pretty good book. Read it. In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. book is more than a hundred years old, still in print. I see it once in a while in thrift stores. I wonder if Charles Sheldon could ever have imagined that a hundred years after he wrote it, his question, what would Jesus do, would first of all become a popular slogan and that it would be shortened to its initials, WWJD. And not only that, but found on banners and bracelets, coffee cups, Bible covers, T-shirts, all sorts of things. He probably had no idea how things would become so commercialized, even Christian things, and how, how much that would happen toward the, well, I would say that started, of course, in the 20th century and certainly hasn't stopped at all since then. So even if you haven't read the book, you already know the world's famous question that it asks. What you might not know is that the title for the book comes from 1 Peter 2, verse 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. The idea here is Jesus sets examples. And by God's grace, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we try to follow those examples. Now that's, I mean, that's not all there is to the Christian life, but that's, that's a big part of it. I have read that uh, Charles Sheldon was a pastor in Topeka, Kansas, and that he preached a series of sermons on this theme of following Jesus steps, you know, following in his steps. 
in these sermons, he, the way he set it up was kind of a fictional town where the people in this town all decided that they really wanted to do that. They wanted to ask themselves what Jesus would do before they made decisions about what they needed to do. And eventually, Pastor Sheldon turned these sermons into a book that has sold millions of copies and read by millions of people and resulted in millions of WWJD products. To be honest with you, um, when I first saw this question becoming so popular, and of course you can tell that it's popular by the fact that people do the initials rather than full thing, um, I wondered how many people are just displaying initials and how many are actually taking their difficult decisions are praying for God to guide them, and are honestly asking, what would Jesus do? Not just to ask a question, but to expect an answer, and then to do what Jesus would do. So today, that's what we're asking about the Sabbath. What would Jesus do on the Sabbath? Well, it seems to me that a good way to find out what he would do is to see what he actually did do. And so there's a very good answer to that in Mark chapter 2 and chapter 3 that we heard earlier. Whoever divided the Bible up into chapters didn't really do a very good job here because. These two stories really do go together, even though one is in chapter 2 and one is in chapter 3. In fact, this, this whole section goes with the entire chapter 2 of Mark. Um, this, this part of Mark's book is all about the, the religious leaders of Israel kind of keeping their eye on Jesus and looking for every opportunity to challenge the things he was doing. And so in the first part of that chapter, in the part we didn't read, um, he forgave a man's sin, and they asked him, what do you think you're doing? Well, I'm, I'm kind of per paraphrasing a little bit. And then after that, he started kind of coming, you know, mixing in with the lowest scummiest people. And again, they asked him, what do you think you're doing? Then they noticed that Jesus' disciples were not fasting like John the Baptist's disciples did. And they asked him, what do you think you're doing? As if that wasn't enough, now it was Sabbath day. Jesus' disciples were picking grain and then he himself healed a man. And again, they asked him, what do you think you're doing? Well, what Jesus was doing was what Jesus would do on the Sabbath. What Jesus would do and what he encouraged his followers to do, in that case, his disciples, is to meet human need. As I look at these two, uh, I guess you call it Sabbath stories, I, I don't see Jesus or his disciples being selfish. I don't see him doing anything you know, frivolous. I don't see him encouraging his followers to just fool around. <laughs> on the Sabbath? No, the whole emphasis in this scripture is meeting needs. Sometimes it's other people's needs. Sometimes 
It's our own needs. Now, obviously, there are some part some parts of Sabbath observance that don't show up in this scripture uh, because they're not part of this story. It, you know, this scripture didn't say anything about resting from work of the week. It didn't say anything about believers gathering together to worship, except, of course, we did see that Jesus went into the synagogue. Synagogue means gathering just as much as church means gathering. And here we are, gathered. And there's probably some other things that are not mentioned here at all, things that we associate with keeping the Sabbath. Well, if we go to some other scriptures, we will find those things. And we certainly know that Jesus would do those things as well because he did those things. Rest, worship, fellowship. These are all part of the Sabbath-keeping example that Jesus set for us so that we should follow in his steps. Today, the particular issue is, what do we do besides these basics of Sabbath keeping? When we're not at home resting, when we're not in church, what sort of other things are okay on the Sabbath? And what sort of things are not okay? And so, well, sometimes we're faced with decisions. Sabbath keepers have always wrestled with some of these decisions for many years. Here's just a few. Is it all right to be involved in school activities on Sabbath day or you know what we call secular activities? Or we might also include Friday night in that. Is it all right to eat? at a restaurant on the Sabbath? Is it all right to work on the Sabbath if you're not getting paid for it? <laughs> Is it all right to miss church and visit family and friends instead? What about going to the store for some shopping for something you really need? Is it all right to stay home from church? Take a good long nap many other decisions just like these. But what's the answer to those? Well, just look at the examples here in Mark. Does this thing that we're thinking about doing, does it meet a need spiritually, mentally, physically? Is it something that would be of a real help? someone? Is it something that would glorify God? Another way to look at this is to ask yourself, is this thing that I'm thinking about doing on the Sabbath, is this something that I could invite Jesus to come along with me? Is this something he would do? Like I can't give you the answer to every possible activity that we could do on the Sabbath. It's impossible to detail every scenario and put it into a do list or a not do list. Goodness, it's been tried. It's, it's been done before. The Jews did that. Sometime I'll tell you about the world famous 39 prohibitions. You know, you can look that up on your uh, 39 prohibitions. It's almost comical, some of the things that are in there. That was the Jews' attempt to define what work is and therefore what rest is. Um, anyway, uh, I might suggest much more recent than that is, I think, a 
what I think is a pretty good resource. Some of you have seen this. This is a book called True to the Sabbath, True to Our God. And it's written by a guy named Larry Graffius. Sometime I'll tell you about Larry. That's, that's quite a story. Um, well, I can just, just say for now that, that uh, Larry was a Seventh-day Baptist pastor, dear friend of ours. And um, anyway, I'm guessing that he started out with a series of sermons, turned it into a pretty good book. In fact, the subtitle of the book is Practical Sabbath Keeping. If anybody wants, wants to borrow it, I can uh, loan that to you. I should just give you a warning. Years ago, and now I'm not talking about the one that I gave, actually ordered and gave to somebody. I'm talking about years ago, the very first copy I had of this book, I loaned it to somebody and never saw it again. So uh, consider yourself warned if you want to borrow this. But even with a good, helpful book, pretty much you're going to have to make your own list of things to do. As usual with the Bible, we have guiding principles that will help us to make our decisions. We've already seen meet human need here in Mark. What I think is, is the best part of what we read is verse 27, Mark 2. The Sabbath was made for man. Whatever we decide to do on the Sabbath, it's not for the sake of the Sabbath. No, the Sabbath is for our sake, not the other way around, according to Jesus. Now, as we've already seen, that doesn't mean that we can be selfish, or greedy, frivolous. You know, those kinds of things Jesus would not do. Because uh, if I can put it this way, those kinds of things would be meeting human wants, not human needs. Jesus was interested in meeting human needs. You know that you know living in a metro major metropolitan area, there are all sorts of things that are happening on Sabbath days and Friday nights. Goodness, all sorts of places we could go, all sorts of things to do. Uh, anyway, that's one of the reasons why we need to be thinking about these kinds of things. I would just ask that you be honest enough before God to, to ask the question that's on your coffee mug or your bumper sticker or wherever it might be. Ask yourself. What really would Jesus do on the Sabbath? And then look into the Word to see what he did do. The Gospels are full of things that Jesus did on the Sabbath. We only saw just a couple of them here. But these two are important because they show, they show us the main issue. The Sabbath is for us, for people. And so it's okay to spend some Sabbath time meeting people's needs. That's what Jesus would do. That's what Jesus did do. And as he said on another occasion, slightly out of context here, but I think it applies, another time he said, go and do likewise. He left us the example to follow in his steps. Our closing song is, got, well, I almost said page number. No, we don't have page numbers here, do we? Um, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Starts at the bottom of the page and continues over. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Lord God, this is already a good Sabbath and it's not over yet. We're just grateful for this gathering. We're grateful for this fellowship. Thank you for good reasons of 
getting us together each week. So Lord, bless us as we continue on through. And uh, we just just thank you for, for your mercy and for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.